may be seated. Uh, and we're going to revisit, revisit uh, Jacob's probably most depressing statement of, of this morning's Parsha. Um, and so since it is a, since it is a depressing statement, uh, we'll start with a joke. Um, so, so imagine it's a census year. Um, and as we know, in a census year, not everyone sends in their form. And so we have um, good natured people who wind up going from door to door, trying to reach every single person in the country. Uh, so one day, a census taker come, a census taker arrives at the house of the Goldman family, and he knocks on the door. And a man comes down and answers the door. Does Louis Goldman live here? The census taker asks. No, replies Goldman. Well, then what is your name? Well, I'm Louis Goldman. Wait a minute, says the census taker. Didn't you just tell me that Louis Goldman doesn't live here? Uh-huh, says Mr. Goldman. You call this living? <laughs> so that joke, that joke was what popped into my mind when I read from this morning's Parsha, uh, Genesis chapter 47, verse 9. As I pointed out earlier, in response to Pharaoh asking him how old he is, Jacob answers, Vayomer Yaakov el paro yimei shnei megurai shoshimu me'at shana, me'at veraim, veraim hayu yimei shnei chayai, velo hisigu et yimei shnei chaye avotai bimei megurehem. And Jacob answered Pharaoh, the years of my sojourn on earth are 130. Few and hard have been the years of my life, nor do they come up to the lifespans of my fathers during their sojourns. As the commentary in our Eitz Chaim Chumash points out, one would not expect Jacob to sound so bitter about his life. At the very least, something doesn't match up. You cannot justifiably make the claim that you are 130 years old and that your years have been few. Furthermore, as several commentaries are eager to point out, Jacob is still alive. His father and his grandfather are not. How can he possibly know how his lifespan will compare to theirs? As an aside, he winds up being right. Um, although Jacob lives to 147, Abraham lived to be 175, and Isaac was the longest lived at 180 years uh, when he died. But we need to think about the context and the content of this comment. Pharaoh is making small talk with Jacob, and this is how Jacob replies. My guess is that Jacob probably won't be getting invited to any more parties at Pharaoh's palace anytime soon. More importantly though, at this moment, we think that Jacob's saga is finally over. He's reunited with his beloved Joseph after decades. His family is fed. They're safe. They should be happy. He should be happy. And looking back on his life, we're talking about Jacob. We're talking about Israel, the man whose legacy we carry. He is the father of the tribes, the man who wrestled with his vicious older brother and came out on top. He went toe-to-toe -to -toe with his wicked father-in-law and beat him as well. He even wrestled with an angel of God and won. Material wealth and blessings seem to follow Jacob no matter where he goes and what happens to him. His life was definitely not short, and while it certainly had its hard moments, it seems like there was a lot more there than just those moments. So I want to share with you two different perspectives diving into what Jacob is processing in this episode. The first is from Robert Alter. I know I've been quoting him a lot recently, um, but I also, I think his work is brilliant, uh, and I don't have his volume on Exodus, so I want to make the most of his work while I have it in front of me in my office. Alter writes, commenting on this verse, that Jacob's somber summary of his own life echoes with a kind of complex solemnity against all that we have seen him undergo. He has, after all, achieved everything he aspired to achieve. The birthright, the birthright, the blessing, marriage with his beloved Rachel, progeny, and wealth. 
But one measure of the profound moral realism of the story is that although he gets everything he wanted, it is not the way he would have wanted. And the consequence is far more pain than contentment. From his clashing with his twin in the womb, everything has been a struggle. He displaces Esau, but only at the price of fear and lingering guilt and long exile. He gets Rachel, but only by having Leah imposed on him with all the domestic strife that entails, and he loses Rachel early in childbirth. He is given a new name by his divine adversary, but comes away with a permanent wound. He gets the full solar year number of 12 sons, but there is enmity among them, for which he bears some responsibility. And he spends 22 years continually grieving over his favorite son, who he believes is dead. This is, in sum, a story with a happy ending that withholds any simple feeling of happiness at the end. Dr. Ellen Frankel, in her book, The Five Books of Miriam, gives a similar take, but honing in on one aspect of loss in Jacob's life. Writing in the voice of the deceased Rachel and imagining how Jacob might see himself, she writes, Poor Jacob, by the time our family went down to Egypt, I had been long dead, and my sister Leah was also waiting patiently for Jacob in the family cave of Machpelah. Bilhah and Zilpah had also died. He's already buried four wives and consoled 12 orphans. So although he was surrounded by 70 descendants who belonged to him, he had become a very lonely old man. He could never replace what was lost. There are two different narratives being told in these two descriptions of one sad man. Robert Alter paints a picture of regret, of incompleteness as a result of success only coming through hardship. Jacob's life was a roller coaster with the highest highs and the lowest lows. And what this verse represents is a peek into how Jacob perceived this sum total, even with the benefit of hindsight. His good fortune, for him, his good fortune is easily overshadowed as his vision is clouded by his failures and struggles. Ellen Frankel describes a different man, a man whose 130 years have been irreparably tinted by loss. The price Jacob pays for taking four wives, and we hope loving each and every one of them dearly, but also outliving them, was the pain of having to say goodbye to each of them in turn. And if he characterizes his own long life as short, imagine how he thinks of the lives of the four women whom he outlived. For him, his hardship is just too much to overlook. The question the text and the commentaries, both ancient and modern, don't address is, well, what did Pharaoh say next? What would you say in response in this situation? And really, maybe what I'm asking is what would I say? It is, after all, part of my job. We can imagine the awkward silence that inevitably ensued in this conversation. Perhaps Pharaoh was dumbstruck and really didn't say anything at all, as is reflected in the text. Which highlights to me something that we mentioned in passing. I believe it was last week, it could have been two weeks ago. I think in different ways, we can each imagine ourselves in this scenario, certainly as Pharaoh listening to someone give this kind of woeful tale and description. You ask someone a simple question, for example, you ask them how they're doing or even how old they are, and instead of a simple answer, you get deep emotions. Emotions, you wanna run away from that sometimes. <laughs> but you really, what we need is we need to be prepared for a complex answer. As witnesses, as bystanders, we really cannot get a clear enough window into anyone's life. We've been studying Jacob's life, Jacob's story with a magnifying glass 
for the past weeks and months, and for most of us for the past years and decades as we come to these episodes once a year, every year. And to know how Jacob feels about walking a mile in his own shoes, or in this case, living one day of 130 long years as Jacob, we still don't have a clue. And when we're put in that situation of needing to respond in that moment, it's not our role to have the perfect response lined up or to tell Jacob that he's being a bummer and remind him of all the blessings in his life. It's not our role to try to immediately fix the person or the situation or the viewpoint. Rather, we need to recognize that sometimes the most effective thing we can do is sit down with the person, say that that sounds so hard, and prepare to listen well. And in doing so, hopefully we can change that punchline from, you call this living, or 130 long and hard, or short and hard years, to a more nuanced, there have been some bumps along the road in my 130 years, but I'm still grateful for the blessings which I have received in my life.